right, in this video we're going to start talking about transcription factors and the promoter in eukaryotes uh, in a general way. So here we have three pictures and uh, what I want to show is that this is uh, here the uh, orange and yellow along here is the DNA of course and we have uh, essentially the beginning of a gene. Uh, so here would be the gene, gene right here right here and right here that's that's kind of like where you would start um, transcribing so the transcription start site is basically where the green part is all right let's uh, let's go back to the pen yeah, that's better that disappears after a second I like that all right so what we're showing to initiate transcription you have to have a lot of proteins stick to the promoter now there are different areas of the promoter. There's the core promoter, there's the uh, proximal promoter, that means relatively close, there's the distal promoter, and uh, which is even further out, and then you have um, enhancers which may be even further out, uh, and none of this is set in stone. Different books will tell you different things, different papers use different terms. It's very confusing at this point in the research, but um, we know enough, uh, even though people haven't decided exactly on the terminology to use, uh, we know enough to, to have knowledge that is useful, all right? And so we need to come up in this class with some terms uh, that I'm going to borrow from, some, from different books and different papers that I think are the easiest to understand. And we're going to start with just the idea of the general promoter. Now, the general promoter here is, of course, before the transcription start site. So if we say this is the transcription start site, it's going to be to the left, the promoter. But that doesn't mean that's the only place that transcription factors can bind. Transcription factors can bind into the gene, all right? So there can be transcription factor binding sites within the gene after the transcription start site. So just because this here shows all these transcription factors binding before the transcription start site, which is here, doesn't mean that there can't be some over here interacting with it. They can. Now it doesn't go too far. It's usually in the UTR region uh, before, the re uh, before the reading frame, the start codon starts, but it can be definitely after the transcription start site. So just keep that in mind. Uh, there are no hard and fast rules there. The majority of them are over here, but you can get some out here into the gene. All right. So um, transcription factors have to bind first. <coughs> and that is actually even before the RNA polymerase often. So this one shows the big blue one here as being the RNA polymerase. There are a few of them that have to actually bind before the RNA polymerase. One of them, if you have a TATA box, now remember, TATA is not the only um, place that RNA uh, polymerase can bind, and technically that's not the purpose of the TATA box. There is a protein called the TATA box, or the TATA binding protein, TBD, which I'll show you in a little bit. And technically that has to bind uh, before you'll ever get transcription going. Now as far as RNA polymerase, we, ne we didn't know this until maybe 10, 12 years ago, which seems like a long time, but it's a very short time really, in the, because it'll be discovered, but then it won't work its way out into general knowledge for a while, and it certainly hasn't gotten into the uh, introductory textbooks yet. So even 10 or 12 years is not enough to get it into the textbooks. But what we realize and what I want you to know is RNA polymerase will really pretty much stick to any piece of DNA. It's really kind of funny. We used to say, oh, it only sticks to like the TATA box or to a promoter sequence, uh, 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 the, the TATA box or a CG box. And that's not the case at all. When we take long strings of human DNA, all right, and we just take it out of the cell and we start playing around with it, and we just add a bunch of RNA polymerase to it, it sticks to regions near a TATA box. 
and it sticks to regions near a GC box, and it also sticks to pretty much every other part of the DNA as well, um, especially pieces that are in a promoter. So the promoter, the real thing that gets RNA polymerase to stick is the curvature of the DNA. The curvature of the DNA is actually the number one thing getting RNA polymerase to be attracted to the DNA. Or you might think of it this way. RNA polymerase is attracted to DNA, period. But it doesn't actually stick to the DNA unless the curvature is right of the strand. And then it will stick. And so any place that there is a bend in the DNA that's just the right angle, then you're going to get RNA polymerase to stick. But then, of course, it's not going to move and start transcription unless there are a lot of other things going on that bind near it and also uh, fine-tune that curvature. So there's a curvature needed for it sticking, but then there's even a more fine-tuning of the curvature to get it moving. And then there also has to be several proteins around. Now, the interesting thing is the protein that binds like many transcription factors, one of them is the TATA binding factor. And if there is a TATA box, the TATA binding factor is there not to actually help the RNA polymerase move. Uh, the TATA binding factor is actually there to make sure it only goes in one direction. Um, realize the RNA polymerase can bind on this piece of DNA and it's double stranded and it doesn't have to move on any given strand. It can move on either strand and so the TATA factor is there to make sure that it moves in the correct direction. All right, Instead of just, uh, well, I'm going to go this way. I'm going to go to the left. I'm going to go to the right. And so because you are, realize you are three prime on to five prime on one strand and then the reverse on the other because uh, RNA polymerase moves three prime to five prime and uh, it could do that on either strand. Uh, so really the TATA factor is to is there to actually make it go in only one direction. So in other words, if it binds on the left of the RNA polymerase, then it's going then the polymerase is going to move in this direction. If, however, the TATA factor were to bind over here on this side, say here, then it's going to move in this direction. All right, it's going to move to the left and it's going to start copying maybe not this strand, but the, the complement, the one that would be uh, if the double strand. It realize one of them's going one way, the other one's going the other way. And basically, whichever one that TATA binds to, whichever side of the RNA polymerase it binds to, the polymerase can only go in that one direction. And so now we know that TATA isn't actually there to attract the RNA polymerase or anything. It's really there to make sure it only goes in one direction. And there are a lot of other transcription factors that do something very similar to the TATA binding factor. These other proteins are here to assist the RNA polymerase in doing whatever it should be doing in conjunction with that gene. And so you might get a strand of DNA, all right, like this, and we have a gene here, and we have a TATA here. and RNA polymerase binds and the TATA factor will bind as well and make sure it goes in this direction. Now there are a lot of other factors. Maybe you're learning about some of those in molecular. I won't go into those. That's for that class, not for this class. There are many, many factors that are involved in that. We're interested in the ones that you can uh, use to annotate your gene and find out about your gene function and things like that. That's what we're interested in. We're interested in finding genes and then finding out uh, how they're related to other genes, how they're regulated, uh, and what they do. Um, the actual proteins that are sticking here are not of huge concern. Uh, probably this lecture here is probably the place where we would be more concerned about the proteins that are binding than any place else. And we're interested in specifically ones that regulate the gene in some way. And those are generally called transcription factors, but there are many of them, many, many, many different things. Uh, a lot of them have to do with the bending of the DNA. Uh, I've mentioned one called the GAGA before. 
that's the sequence that it sticks to. Instead of TATA, -T -A, it bends to uh, GAGA. -G -A. And I think in the other video I said it was graph. It's actually GAF. Uh, I looked it up and it's not graph. I don't know where I got graph. I put an R in there. But it's GAF. And so the GAF protein sticks to the GAGA, GAGA, whichever way you want to say it. I think Lady Gaga, so I, it's the Gaga factor. All right, so the, the Gaga factor here, if you want to call it that, the GAF protein, and GAF stands for GAGA, -G -A, or Gaga activating factor, or Gaga, um, um, yeah, I think it's activating factor. So uh, it's a transcription factor. And what it does is it's actually a bending protein. GAGA -G -A is rather flexible. And it's really flexible, that, that piece of DNA. And it's really flexible if GAF sticks to it. If GAF sticks to it, you can bend it like this. So you put your GAGA -G -A right along here. All right. And GAF protein sticks there. And now it doesn't just bend a little. It bends a lot. And it doesn't break with GAF on there. So it kind of reinforces the DNA, you might think, so that you can bend it around. And that's going to be, of course, important, as we're going to see. And as you might have seen in some other pictures where the DNA bends over on itself. Uh, we had something like that with the, uh, with the LAC operon, when the O sequence is bent over. I didn't go into a lot of detail on that this semester, but I have in other semesters kind of to set this up. But in our case, we do want to look at it here in eukaryotes. So realize when all of these factors bind, and everything's just right for the RNA polymerase, uh, the shape of the DNA, the other proteins that are around it, like the uh, TATA binding factor. When everything is all set up, boom, it'll go and start transcription. And realize all along the strand, all right, the DNA, RNA polymerase may be sticking all over the place. There may be RNA polymerase everywhere along here. Now it just so happens your gene is here and there are gonna be a lot of places right before a gene that RNA polymerase can bind. And uh, there's a lot of speculation that uh, binding at some of these, many of them might be start sites and we just don't see them very often. And maybe there are genes that we are missing or extensions of the genes that we are not seeing but that's beyond this class. We will stick to, okay, there's just one place, but realize there are probably, all right, several places along here that, um, that it could actually bind and maybe even start transcription under the right circumstances. And we just never have seen the RNA. We've never seen this long RNA. Maybe the one we see most of the time is this one, so we've always assumed that this is the gene, but maybe really the gene is potentially here. There's a lot of speculation about if that's the case. Uh, nothing proven, you know, one or two outlier cases, but if it only happens once or twice in the genome, uh, but a lot of people think it happens a lot. So uh, just throwing it out there that really we do not understand this anywhere near as close as we understand something like the lac operon. All right, so moving on to the next picture, here is what I was kind of uh, ex trying to explain on the last one. Let's see if we can zoom this in and uh, let's do Control plus plus. Let's try that. No, that doesn't seem to work. So let's go ahead and use a little better, I guess. Okay, so let's look at this. So here is where had a binding protein, all right, RNA polymerase. So what is this telling us? Uh, it's going to make for sure it goes in one direction or the other. Here I think it's got it going, uh, well, it wouldn't go 5 prime to 3 prime. It's going to make it go, it's going to go this way. But uh, this, uh, are they, they have this right. Um, if this is 5 prime, you read it. Yeah, that's right. No, no, it's not. This would be RNA. Um, they have this wrong in this picture. Think about this for a second. Uh, you make an RNA, and it has a 5 prime cap. So the RNA is 5 prime. This one is 3 prime. 
So therefore the DNA where you would have your tata box, ah, somebody made a picture wrong. That's three prime and that's five prime if this is gonna be DNA. All right, so, um, because you it would be the complement to the RNA, uh, so realize that RNA has a five prime cap and that has to be, that is made first. So if the five prime is on the RNA, then the DNA, where all of these stick, has to be three prime to five prime. This is an incorrect graphic somebody put in. Uh, I got it from a textbook and it's wrong. Um, so uh, beyond that, it's a nice little graphic. Here's your TATA box and here's your, uh, so you have TATA binding protein. Here's your RNA polymerase and here are your transcription factors like the GAGA I just talked about. And so it binds and sure enough, it bends, all right? But uh, I am really, I I'm, I'm, I'm don't think I'm going crazy. I know that RNA, I just can't believe they made that obvious of a mistake. I know your RNA is going to be read five prime to five prime. It's made five prime to three prime. It's because you have a five prime cap. Um, so therefore DNA always, hmm, just obvious mistake. All right, but this is still a good graphic to show you the bending of the DNA. Um, here is a case of DNA being bound by a protein. Now this protein, I believe this is actually, I did not, I did not copy the name of this protein. I think this is actually the TATA binding protein is what I did after this one. I, uh, I said, oh, let's find a picture of, and I believe this is two what we call um, zinc fingers. Uh, I would have to actually know the more of the chemistry of this protein here, but you'll notice how it fits into the uh, into the grooves of the DNA. So if you in molecular you study about the grooves, there's the minor groove and the major groove, etc. Well, these zinc fingers, and hopefully you have read about these before a little bit. These zinc fingers fit in there, and they attach to the DNA. Essentially, they bind. Um, not covalently, usually uh, hydrogen bonds, the weaker ones, but but they come in and they bind. And this one, I believe, I believe that's what I was doing when I made gathered these. Is I was looking for the TATA binding protein, so this very well may be. But it doesn't matter. I, I just wanted you to see that uh, the how a protein sticks to the DNA. See an example of that. You may or may not be in molecular and may not be studying this. I don't know that you're studying it at this level. Uh, in molecular either, but I do believe that it's important to see this and see how it will fit into these grooves and, and attach to the actual DNA. All right, now here's one we haven't seen, and this is very recent. This was is within the last five years that we realized that actually RNA polymerases create a uh, a complex around this thing called the porous protein core. And what RNA polymerase does is it, it attaches to the outside and then you can have some of these transcription factors that work with it and you actually thread the DNA through this kind of protein complex which is made of several transcription factors. And notice it comes through twice. So you end up copying two genes at the same time and you have this piece out here uh, kind of it this thing kind of rolls along the DNA it was fascinating there I, I found a movie and lost it that showed how this worked but we just recently realized this is how this worked this is kind of like a big machine of multiple RNA polymerases that threads the uh, DNA through here twice uh, really cool stuff uh, but realize it really is all about the bending of the DNA. It's the shape of the DNA as it uh, as it curves through, and if it doesn't have the right angle right in through here, then the RNA polymerase is not going to uh, to work and and make an RNA. Now we move on here, and this might be something that you've seen in molecular. And this is kind of how it has it all put together. And notice in this one, they went ahead and put three RNA polymerases in here, which 
takes into account this. So one, two, there are three RNA polymerases, see right here. So this is what you're looking at in this picture. And they're showing you that what's holding this DNA together to put this loop out here are all of these different transcription factors is what they're calling them. And the transcription factors are binding to an area called the enhancer, not to the promoter. Um, and they're calling these mediator proteins because they do not bind to uh, uh, any DNA. They kind of bind transcription factors to transcription factors. So you see transcription factors here and you see some transcription factors here, but then you have these things called mediator uh, proteins uh, and they also bind in here. And then here is your RNA polymerase uh, kind of uh, complex down here. And so it's a really complicated system, far more than we thought just a few years ago. And then of course down here you have this loop. You should probably have a GAGA or something down here to allow the DNA to bend like this. Uh, so maybe you would have GA, GA here and you'd have that gaff I just told you about binding here to allow this to bend more and become more flexible to bend over like this. Now the uh, the transcription factors involved in all in here uh, there are just a ton of them and you can study um, I took a graduate molecular class uh, to refresh myself a few years ago and uh, man, there are just so many of these things. Um, and it's so different between species and even between, uh, realize there are many RNA polymerases that do certain types of genes. Um, we talk about RNA polymerase too because it's the one that's best studied. But realize that uh, what we're looking at here is, uh, and it's the one that is used the most too. But uh, you get very far off into this literature and it just gets infinitely more complex. You still need to learn the general idea and all of them kind of work this way. Uh, and you'll notice, of course, there are eRNAs. I don't know if we'll get to RNA interference and RNA mediation uh, in this semester. I got to it last, last year when uh, when I last taught this. I don't know if we'll get to it, but I'll mention it now that we also have to take into account RNAs. Now we're making an RNA, an mRNA here, but there are these non-coding, and they're calling them eRNAs here. These are RNAs that also need to bind to uh, help control um, and regulate this gene. They often are used to pause. You'll get everything set up, and then you stop and you pause for a while. And that pause is caused by these RNAs a lot of the time that will stick and kind of keep this on hold. Like you're, you're, we're all set up and we're ready to go, but we're not going to start copying for a while. And guess what makes these eRNAs? A lot of these are those things that are cut out of the genes, the introns. The introns, of course, that get cut out from another gene, you often end up being these eRNAs that cause pausing in the transcription of another gene or another set of genes. Fascinating stuff, way too much for us in, an, in a class like this. But the idea is everything is connected and it's used there for a reason. You cut out the introns for a gene and while it's getting made, you need to pause other genes from being made because those proteins that those other genes are making might chemically interfere with the protein you're trying to make. So if you're trying to make one protein, you need to slow down the production of others. And so those introns get cut out. And we never knew this. This, this is the idea that the introns get cut out and can pause other genes while that gene is being made is just, you know, it makes it so complex. We really don't know uh, everything that's going on. And this is why, uh, now I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but this is why I am very concerned whenever they talk about RNA interference or RNA vaccines. This process is called RNA interference. And we don't know if that virus 
the COVID virus, if part of that virus can act as an interfering RNA in some of our genes, and if so, a, if a piece of that, now nobody knows if that's the case or not, but if a piece of that virus was capable of binding here like one of these, it could pause several of your genes and cause all kinds of problems. And maybe that's what happened. Maybe that's why some people get sick and others don't. We don't know. And I thought that was, it's very, very, to me, irresponsible to use RNA vaccines on people. I know I'm sounding like a, 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 a um, conspiracy theorist. Uh, I'm not saying it's conspiracy. I'm just saying, man, you took some risk here. You don't know that, that when you put RNA to a person, uh, we aren't sure how this works. And we don't know what genes it might potentially affect. And viruses tend to pull in RNA sequences that have functions. In other words, how viruses evolve is they borrow yours. They borrow your RNAs to make themselves. And I am certain nobody did any studies to see if potentially this RNA has a function for interfering with certain certain gene networks, which is what we have here. And um, I'm just throwing that out there. It's just that I find it, I find it very scary. Uh, I'll put it that way. Hey, I took the, uh, the vaccine, you know, no problem. Uh, but I have my reservations about, about this issue right here, these interfering RNAs. We aren't sure how this works. So I don't want to make an alarmist, be an alarmist, but you know, I'm just saying it's a little irresponsible in my opinion. But of course they wanted to uh, fight the, the, vac the uh, fight COVID, fight the virus, and this was the quickest way they could do it. But, uh, but you, we are at risk because we do not understand how this works. All right, and back to what we talked about before and uh, recently in our previous uh, video we have protein factors transposable uh, transcription factors uh, this is a different type of transcription factor here co-activators and these have to do with the ones that can methylate and unmethylate your genes and essentially unwind your DNA off of the histones so these are the ones that kind of do methylation and either add methylation or take methylation off. And these, what we call, rearrange the nucleosomes. They can move these nucleosomes off of a piece of DNA and open it up for transcription. In other words, they can turn genes on or they can turn genes off. And uh, we aren't going to get into this. Uh, I did last year talk about it a little more than I am this year. I do want you to know that it exists. Uh, so there might be a quiz at some point where I ask you um, something about this, but uh, at this point I just want you to know that it exists. And that means there are these transcription factors, and they some people call them co-activators, and what they do is they alter the methylation and, uh, and some other things that we haven't talked about. Realize the histones themselves, the little proteins that, that their DNA wraps around, they can be altered also, and one of the ways they can be altered is to be methylated. You can methylate them, acylate them, and uh, a couple of different things. In other words, you can add chemical groups to the pieces of these proteins that make them, you might say, stickier or unstickier, or uh, I, you know, for lack of better term, they actually interact with the DNA differently depending on on how you alter these little histone proteins. And so a lot of times you'll have these proteins called hats that uh, come in and, and methylate or demethylate. And uh, here, of course, this is turning all of these, all of this DNA is turned off. Here we have some open space and therefore it's uh, open for RNA polymerase to come in and attach. You do need to understand this concept that open DNA right here can allow RNA polymerase to attach down here no attaching, all right? This is this is what we call compacted DNA. Um, this is uh, uh, this is looser DNA. It's not not compacted. There's not necessarily a, a term. It's open, I guess, is what, what we'd say. Open here, they're calling it condensed. Uh, you might hear it as compacted. 
uh, but the compacted or condensed DNA is off and the uncompacted or the open DNA that is uh, that's open for tr possible transcription. All right, that's enough for this time. I have a whole, the closest thing we have to a book is, oh, four or five pages of me giving you facts about uh, promoters. And uh, that's kind of, I guess, my specialty. I know a lot about promoters. And uh, we're gonna study those promoters as well as we can uh, once we figure out where our genes are in project three and we're going to try and figure out if uh, if there are any transcription factors in those promoters I should say transcription factor binding sites and see if they can give us some clues as to the function of these genes because the cool thing about the genes I've given you in our sequences is they are putative genes in other words the computer says there's a gene there may or may not you need to work on that and find out if you think there is and then find the promoter of it and one thing that will be telling is that in the promoter of your gene you will have to have certain binding sites for the transcription factors that are used in algae and we do know those we actually know the binding sites that algae and specifically e hooks use in their promoters and if it does if your region that you think is a gene doesn't have a few of those places, those sequences that those those transcription factors can bind to, if they're not there, then that's not a gene. And that's going to be one way you can tell if you have the right place in your gene. I mean, if you have the right place in your sequence for that gene. And we'll get to that here in a week, uh, maybe a little after Thanksgiving. Um, so we'll be working on that and then just working on that through till the end of the semester when you turn in your final your project three but this is the kind of thing we're going to be talking about instead of talking about o's and cap and all that in the lac operon we're going to be talking mostly about uh well not that um about the promoter in other words about about this region up in front of the gene you know from here on all right, from here on, we're going to be talking a lot about that and how to uh, figure out how uh, to figure out essentially what sticks there. All right, that's what we want to find out. And then from that, you can tell um, what genes, what other genes are related to it, because genes that have the same transcription factor binding sites are functionally related. Just like Z, Y, and A are related, well, the equivalent of that in eukaryotic genes is they have common transcription factors that bind to their promoter and therefore they are regulated together because what regulates these genes it's primarily the transcription factors it once it's turned on then it gets regulated by these and you regulate a whole set of genes together by making a transcription factor in that cell which will then can then regulate this gene in conjunction with other genes. Uh, we'll try to talk a little bit about that RNA interference stuff I talked about that has to do with introns, uh, but I don't know that we'll ever get to the point where you have to do any actual work with it. All right, that's it for this week, uh, or at least for this video, and uh, contact me if you have questions. Uh, if any of this is confusing to you, please feel free to Zoom with me. Um, you know, uh, I, we can talk about this in, in private, one-on-one, -on -one, and I can explain more of it to you if you need it. All right.